So my name is Noel. Uh, I go by Nonek. Uh, you're here for the government legislative data. No, go back one. Uh, the uh, government legislative data and other uh, white fail whales and how to avoid it. Right. That's, um, so uh, you have uh, three lone wolves up here. Uh, you have Jared Williams, who's off in the far left, Graylin Kilm, who's here in the middle, and I'm Noel Hidalgo. Uh, I go by No Neck. Uh, so uh, let me, I'm just going to do the quick history of well, open government at the New York State Senate, um, and, and then actually let the, the geeks uh, geek out. Uh, let's see if this has been working better. Um, so here's a picture of the New York State Capitol 100 years ago. Here's a picture of the New York State Capitol inside 100 years ago. And if you go there today, not much has changed. All right. Uh, so uh, speaking about like 100 years ago uh, type of technology, um, when we first got there in 2008, um, the Democrats had just taken over um, from the Republicans who had been there for close to uh, 40 years. Uh, party switch uh, in that time period, you know, through the ushering in of uh, uh, Barack Obama and this whole conversation about we government and government 2.0 that had been building up over the, the few years, there was the this decision to hire a CIO. His name was Andrew Hoppin. Um, I was his uh, second hire uh, in the office to kind of help shepherd a, a radical change of, of uh, technology inside of the Senate because uh, when uh, the senators who had been there, uh, this was their CRM. Uh, it was a green screen terminal, um, and you had to memorize a whole stack of, of keyboard commands to go back and forth. Um, it, the business name um, was also doubled as the ERM, uh, the email field. Um, you had five lines of notes that you could take, so if you ever wanted to add a sixth note to this particular record, you had to delete one of the ones beforehand. Um, our website was, uh, uh, was a static HTML page. Um, it didn't really provide any type of information. Uh, it just really just pushed people to, um, to you know, other pieces of information. Um, and the, was that a question? Yeah. Okay. So, so again, this was 2000, maybe? So not too long ago? Yeah, not too long ago. So, um, and then when, we, this was, um, uh, this was our, the legislative uh, back-end lookup system. Uh, this is still in, in, in operation. There's a mainframe that's, that runs this. It's a $12 million operation. Um, they have uh, close to one or two million dollars worth of people that they pay in salary to do sales, um, which doesn't quite make sense because they effectively only pull in one or two million dollars in sales uh, for selling access to this. And this system here is a, is a classical uh, uh, pay-to-play system. Um, so the people who have, the, who have premium access to it are the people who can afford thousands of dollars a year in subscription fees, whereas the people who can't afford to pay for it, which is primarily the public, have a very limited access. And, and subsequently, um, we had to remove a slide that, uh, which back when the uh, Democrats were in power, we could show, but now the Republicans are in power, I can't show, um, uh, was the fact of just news clippings of, of, of um, senators uh, being charged with corruption charges. One of them we had to kick out during the two years that I was there because he assaulted his girlfriend. Um, uh, it, another one was just recently arrested for um, a pay to play. And this was this is the culture of, uh, of most state government. New York being a little uh, uh, particular because they like to flaunt their corruption uh, in ways. Uh, the previous speaker uh, not just the one that was under the Democratic administration, but the Republican one uh, is, was found guilty of corruption charges. The one that, the first one, the first of two during the Democratic administration uh, was brought up with a bunch of corruption charges and other pays to play. And so, you know, there was this institution of, uh, of, of pay to play and inaccessibility and lack of transparency. And when the CIO's office was created two years ago was to change all of that. And so um, the first thing that we, one of the services that we did, including revamping the nysenate.gov website, um, was to create this uh, open leg. Um, we, uh, it, we just kind of we were being cute about it. Um, uh, it got us in trouble later on because open leg, if you Google that, it means something else. Um, we thought it was cute to be open ledge, but it was open leg. Um, and so when we started redesigning it, um, you know, 
Graylin and, and Jared are going to talk about the digital system that's behind this. Uh, but we, we were like, oh, what we'll do is just, you know, kind of news feeds of, of pieces of legislation that are coming up here. So that was our, our Yahoo version. Um, and then, um, oh, wait, how do I go back? Thank you. Um, so in, forward. Um, so what we ended up doing um, was creating a mobile app because uh, everybody had Blackberries and there was this institution of Blackberries, but we couldn't figure out how to have a, a really clean, simple interface that added the, that had the same pieces of information that were on the um, uh, uh, on the website to the mobile app. So we were just like, oh, let's make it just super, super clean, simple. Um, and most of the people, this was accessible uh, across all different devices. Um, and what that led us to do is through the time period that we were experimenting, we realized, oh, wait, actually, let's take a look at all of the other consumer-based tools that are out there, especially since the consumer-based tools of uh, real-time APIs, um, uh, RSS feed, permalinks, the, the ability to share things on social networks, um, uh, Lucene search indexes, uh, or at least easy search indexes, these are the things that we should be doing for legislative data, right? If that's our go-to systems that we use to find pieces of information on the internet, we should be adopting that exact same mentality for uh, what we do here at, at the New York State Senate. So we started playing around with some different prototypes that were more uh, Google-esque, um, and uh, Rev2, uh, after public feedback and kind of a solicitation, we created this uh, open legislation version to Google edition. Um, and it allows for a, a really simple, slick interface that, um, uh, uh, that puts out le uh, legislation in, in three different formats. The legal format, which is uh, this horrendous, unhuman readable format, a human readable format, uh, and then a uh, programmable format that you could be incorporated into your different applications. Um, it also included a bunch of uh, commenting systems so that way you can actually register your comment. Um, and um, that back-end system um, uh, actually ended up creating a feedback mechanism so that way senators could be then emailed, um, which they'll go, Graylin and Jared will go into. Um, and, you know, just like every other uh, Web 2.0 uh, system, we had to have a little bit of humor. So this was our, um, our internal failed beaver. Um, the beaver is the uh, state animal of New York. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll let these guys go and tell how it works. Thank you all. So before we go into... Uh, before we go into... How this uh, how this works? It's it's going to be useful to clarify that it, it really is a, a very simple service. We provide two two primary things. We provide uh, search we provide searchability and, and we provide linkability. Um, and you know with the those are two very powerful things. But it's just, it's just two things. And by you know reducing to by reducing our, our sort of feature requirements to that, we were able to make things very simple. And I think that's one of the I think that's one of the key points here is that uh, what you know what we've got with open legislation is is actually a very very simple system. It's not something that takes like you know millions of dollars to run or set up. It doesn't have a lot of moving parts. And, uh, it's something that a lot of places could employ you know pretty easily. So. If we look at it, you've got uh, we, we split it into four main thing, four main phases. You've got uh, LBDC, which is which runs the uh, service that Noel was talking about that offers out the subscriptions, and uh, so we pull the information from them as sort of a, a primary source, uh, and then we process that information and then we push it out. In this case, to our Lucene index for the searching, uh, and then we publish it out via a Tomcat server. So. Uh, you know, it's it's very very simple. Uh, so you know, the first step we pull and we get the data, and they've actually got an interesting setup that I understand uh, a lot of other states share as well, where uh, the um, the legislature actually has a central body that takes care of the data for both the uh, you know both uh, the assembly and the senate, and then. Uh, you know, and then in our case, we, we wanted more control over the information, and so they'll, they'll send that information back down to the various the individual bodies. 
Uh, and so using that, you know, using a terminal application like you saw earlier, they will enter in the the bill information and the actions and the votes and things like that, and a real-time feed of that gets sent to uh, LBDC, which you know has a mainframe uh, that you know has all that information there. And then periodically, they'll you know they'll write that stuff to logs, and then every five minutes they'll push logs down to us. Um, you know, and it's interesting that the assembly has actually been doing this for a long time. They've been getting this. Uh, the format they send down is called SOPI, um, and They've been getting this a long time, and so we're kind of we're kind of newcomers into this loop. Um, and you can see an example of, of a line of the SOBI format underneath. Uh, it's a fixed width format where you've got the year, the, the bill number it's related to, a sort of line code to indicate what the the rest of the line, the, the payload is uh, is supposed to be. And so, uh, you know, it's a very straightforward format. It's not standard, but but it's very straightforward. The issue with it that we had was that while the format, you know, specification was pretty obvious, um, the behavior wasn't. Like how they recorded the logs, when they recorded the logs, when they duplicated things. Uh, those were all things that weren't really documented and until we had a good communication process with them. Uh, it was very difficult to uh, work it out to get the kind of data quality that we needed. Um, and so. That was the real motivation for our, our next step, which was, uh, you know, a process step. And literally, the the goal of this step is just to uh, separate, to provide an intermediate layer between the uh, log files that we're receiving and the, uh, you know, the database that we're stuffing it. Um, and you know, we've got this for a couple of reasons. One of the big reasons was, like I was saying, data quality. We were having you know, duplicate actions, uh, we were having amendment links where there were amendments, we were missing information, and when we were just straight reading the log files and sticking them in the database, it was very hard to tell where the problem was, like, uh, accountability for it. Was, it. was it their fault, was it our fault, where in our code was it our fault? It was, it was just very difficult to fix the process. And so, you know, we, we put this intermediate layer between the pulling and the pushing into our, our data feeds where we actually will parse it and then we save it to uh, you know, a JSON object file on the file system. Um, and, you know, and it's got, it's got a format that you can see there where it's got the Senate bill numbers, sponsor, co-sponsors, uh, bill text, and all that information. Um, and we also keep a, a SOBI reference list that you can see down towards the bottom, which just sort of gives us a a trail to go back on. So like let's say the information in that is wrong, then we can go and see which log file is uh, you know that was related to and then we can sort of backtrace and we can say, well, uh, you know, in a few cases the, the problem really was their feeds problem. And we were able to say, you know, it was this SOGI file that produced it and here's where it was wrong. Um, you know, in other cases we were able to trace back and say, well all the SOGI files were right, so we must have you know, in our logic somewhere when we were when we were parsing and applying it to the logic, we must have messed something up. And so that was really useful in sort of uh, providing an, an intermediate layer where we can really tell where the problems are and then work with people to fix those problems. Which Jared will talk more about. Yeah. So uh, does this JSON only use within the Senate or in the legislature? So yeah, that's that's just you. We just use that like internally to this open legislation application. Um, that's part of the greater discussion uh, because obviously LBC skills aren't made for uh, we can files that are just aren't in the format uh, for me, whether it's us or it's the assembly or any other sort of third party application. Um, so there's a discussion to migrate uh, there that you know over to uh, a directory format like XML or JSON, um, and that's in the words, but far out in the future. So. But the JSON feed is also used in the mobile app that the, that the center has, right? Right, well, so that's not, that's not strictly <coughs> the, the JSON that you see here. Um, internal JSON. So this is like, this is internal to, to our platform that stores <coughs> the data feeds, and then, uh, you know, one of the great, you know, one of the primary motivations for a tool behind this was that uh, we as the Senate could now have control of that legislative information and you know, we could pipe it into things like our, uh, you know, they've got a new Drupal website, we've got an internal CRM, and we can now, now that we control that information and the interfaces to it, we can pipe it around and, you know, better communicate that information to constituents. Um, 
But so that was that was the main reason for this, and uh, it was just you know, the data quality and the accountability and figuring out where you know where what happened. Um, but there were other benefits too. It's it's great for for you know spot fixes. Like if we do see something's wrong, you know we don't have time to figure out what went wrong and then you know re reparse everything and then reindex and re push it up. So we just say oh you know that's wrong and we can just open the file, fix it, and then you know push it back through the system. And it's just like a minute-long process where it would have been a lot more involved uh, previously. So yeah, and so you know the flat files were convenient uh, for for both that and also backups because you know, you're just like treating any other file thing. Um, it's human readable and editable, which and it also opened the door for a couple interesting ideas we had. One thing we tried to do was. Uh, Every time we got a batch in, we'd put it under a commit and get so we had version control, and we could go back and look at the the dates and times and files associated with all the changes to the process. And, uh, you know, that was something we had to abandon for a little while because the, the repository just got too big. Um, but uh, it opens the door for a lot of interesting ideas because the file format, because you know, the file system has a lot of interesting things about that. Uh, so, so then now that we've got the, so now that we've written to these files and we've got this uh, interpreted object, you know, from all the logs that we've had related to that so far, we've, we've got that represented in a JSON object. And so for each batch, we have a log file. And uh, so we basically load up the log file, and uh, for all the referenced objects, be they bills or actions or votes or calendars or uh, agendas, uh, we load them up and then we we basically push them through this uh, like processing loop where we say, you know, okay, we've got all these changes and we need to represent them in all the different places. So, you know, the first thing that we'll do is we purge the cache pages and varnish, um, just to clear the cache out so that the, the updated information comes across. Uh, and then we push it into the Lucene index, and then we we haven't fully developed this part out, but eventually we're going to do push notifications too, so that. You can be, you know, if you want to subscribe to, you know, bills by your senator or something, instead of having to pull our service, if you were developing like service self of it, we can just say, you know, hey, you're, there's an update on this bill, and then you can react to it at the call bar. So, and then the last step is the most straightforward step. Uh, we just publish it, um, and you know, just a normal web application. We've just got a Tomcat like wrapping basically on the Lucene engine, and we put varnish in front. So, you know, with that, I mean, we can put it all together, and it's a little more complicated than you know what we showed before, but it's still, it's still very simple with very few moving parts, and it's something that, that we think that a lot of places could replicate with success for good service. So, I mean, that was the that was the clean overview of kind of uh, how you know we'd like it to be seen, but. It, you know, we, Jared and I, we got dropped into the project. We were both students, and it was uh, you know, it was already up and it was already running, and so we wound up taking the project over and getting it from where it was with all the data quality issues to where it was now. Actually, it was a pretty bumpy road, and so Jared's going to talk about that a little bit. So story time. Um, yes, yeah, so as as Graylin mentioned, uh, we took over the project uh, mid summer, mid summer last year. Um, and there were quite a few problems. Uh, the service had been out for about a year at that point. Um, it was what we call infinite beta, I guess. Uh, it actually just came out of beta uh, over the past couple of months. Um, so there were tons of issues, uh, mainly with data quality, and we're serving governmental data. Uh, people were using this in applications. Uh, the Senate had a, a desire to use it with internal applications, as really mentioned, I really mentioned the CRM, um, as well as uh, the NYC Gov website. So it was very important that we could make sure that we were maintaining data quality and serving that the most accurate data that we could, ideally uh, as close to 100% accurate as possible. Um, and so we, the users were uh, complaining to us, we were using uh, feedback mechanisms, and people were telling us that they were looking at this bill that their senator proposed, and uh, X was wrong, or Y was wrong, and why can't you fix this, why is this a persistent problem? Um, so we were getting a lot of negative feedback, and there was something that we had to do about that. Um, so 
and also steps that we're taking for integration uh, towards integration on the Android Senate services uh, were taken back. Uh, development had begun and they decided to close those doors and uh, internally there was big discussion about whether or not this project, uh, this project um, could continue or how it would continue. Um, and so, and also people were praising the idea but just saying that it, it needs to be fixed. There, there's, no, there's no reason after a year later that we should be serving this bad information and it hasn't been fixed quite yet. So, um, so beyond that, uh, so when Grail and I jumped on, uh, and after we fixed some of the other problems, that were, uh, the internal problems with the project, uh, we turned around and looked at data quality. Um, and we had to come up with a mechanism to say, okay, if we have this bill, we can guarantee that it's correct. There was no way for us to do this in the past. Um, LBDC, uh, as Grail mentioned, was serving their permission off a mainframe. Uh, their development was, uh, it's not very involved. Um, it was hard for us to speak to them about some sort of process that they could offer us uh, where we could either send them our information, they could give us a checksum about data, uh, or uh, they could, it's some sort of process that wouldn't just involve us having some sort of a handshake to say this is good information. Um, and so we actually had to, we had to kind of threaten them with the idea of scraping their entire website. Um, since it's all, it's, it's a pretty close structure they have, there's ways around it. And we invented, or we came up with this, uh, this, this workflow to do just that. But by the time we had that mechanism, they turned around and they said, we don't necessarily want you doing this, um, and we can just offer you uh, some sort of full data now instead. So we want the SOBI files to work, but in the meantime, we'll give you a mechanism to say, okay, this data is good, um, you can guarantee that. So this has all been over the past several months, um, and we set up, we started meeting with them on a regular basis to create a good a relationship with them, and they give us this data. Uh, Weekly, or they give us the data by weekly so we can scan it against our system and we can say everything looks great um, or there's these problems we need to fix them and it was a two-way road there were issues with the parser on our side so we had to maintain or we had to maintain our parser make sure everything was going up correctly and we pushed uh, feedback upstream or issues or, uh, with, with issues that they were having and um, Raylan said that the assembly has been using this data for years um, but there were still a number of issues to be encountered um, that apparently hadn't been addressed before um, so, we're pushing feedback to them, they're pushing feedback to the journal clerk, the entire process is becoming cleaner, it's becoming a lot more involved, um, and then uh, that's going to lead to other changes uh, in the future, as you mentioned, or you're asking about if they're going to have more structured documents, and us working with them, they've already offered us some XML documents, um, which is something that they had never considered in the past, um, but it's a nice step forward, and I think it's going to lead to a better relationship in general, until uh, they move on to new technology to sort of uh, down the road. Um, and so, in the beginning, uh, there were well over a thousand issues, and by the time we were done with this process, uh, currently um, there are 20, 20 documents with issues. Uh, I created a nice dashboard to see um, which documents had issues so we can easily send that report to them. Um, it's available via JSON API that they can access, or what I typically do is just dump it out in a text file and send it to them. Um, so that's easier for them to look at. So, and so that leaves us with uh, the profit of open legislation. Um, so why is this a great service? Um, it's free for constituents. It's a great place for them to access data as it's coming out in real time. Um, and so this really came in handy with this new uh, data processing that we have and this assurance that the bills are accurate, um, is that people are using the service, um, which is, I mean, that's what we wanted in the first place, but that's not what we're getting. Uh, two, for two years, we had um, a steady but or, almost kind of decreasing data usage. Um, but as we're moving out of beta and as people are using the site and seeing it elsewhere, they're getting a lot more trust. Um, so it, because uh, unlike uh, LBDC's site, you can't link elsewhere. We're getting a lot of mentions on Twitter. Uh, news articles are linking to us because they see us as a primary data source, which is what we wanted in the first place, uh, but we couldn't offer. Um, and then, as we mentioned, integrating with internal tools. Um, so when you go to NYC and you go to your senator's page, you see their legislation right next to their name. You see how it's tied into everything else they're doing, all their initiatives. Um, as well as the CRM. Someone calls and asks, says, I'm interested in this bill, so we make a query to open legislation via the CRM, and we pull that right to their system. And so, as Noel mentioned, we also use uh, accounting system we use Discuss on Open Lunch. So someone can go to a bill page and they can say, uh, they can comment on it. Um, we do receive a number of comments. It's not, um, 
it's not out of control necessarily, necessarily, but people are using it. And when people use it, they're extremely passionate about what we're saying. Uh, they trust the service, um, and they believe that they're reaching out to someone. That's the main goal. For them to trust the service, see it as uh, uh, the one place they can go to reach out to their senator, whether it's or, well, there or via yeah, NYC Senate go up um, and reach out to their senator. And so we have, the, what's interesting is what people actually go to the site to see. Uh, listed out the three most popular bills there. Um, and the first one is related to e-cigarettes. The second one is related to liquor stores. And the third one is related to cigarettes again. So people are coming for certain reasons. Um, <laughs> but they're still coming, and they're still seeing this as a valuable resource. There are obviously many other bills with a lot of comments. Um, these just happen to be the top three, and you can kind of take that as you will. Um, and the, uh, the other interesting, go ahead. Uh, this is the only, the, the only comments or about your so we do, that's what I was going to get to next. We do own the comments. Uh, it's stored on their servers, uh, but they offer an easy way to export XML or to use their API to grab the information. Um, so we created a service, or I created a service called Bill Buzz. Um, and so those comments people are leaving on bills, uh, you can see them on the bill page, bill page, but for an entire session, you end up with close to 20,000 bills. So it's not reasonable to say, okay, let's go through all my bills today and see who left comments. Um, so via Discusses API, um, on a daily basis or uh, on a, a couple times a day, we'll go through and we'll aggregate the latest comments and tie them to the bills that they're associated with. Um, and then we, Bill Buzz allows someone to sign up and say, I want to follow this senator or these senators or these parties, and I want to receive updates for le their legislation. So anytime someone comments on S7234, uh, a couple hours later, they get an email that says, hey, this has been commented on, check it out. Uh, if you want to respond, feel free. Um, and so it's great for constituents because if someone is, uh, this bill is associated with someone or it's relevant to them, they can keep track of it. But for senators, it's a great way for them to be in contact with their constituents. Um, it's an incredibly powerful way for them to be in contact with them. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I think it's a great service, and I think there's a lot more we can do with it. Um, as we move on and as we move past all these data quality and server issues we faced in the past. So, um, and another, another profit section, uh, we offer a powerful search API. Um, so using Lucene, uh, we stuff certain values into it. Um, so you can easily pull up bullet voting correlations. If you want to see where Senator X voted with Senator Y but didn't vote with Senator Z, you can really easily find that information. Um, same thing with bills that have been passed. You just search by an action and search for the sponsor. Um, and you can do the same thing with bills that maybe uh, were stricken. So if bills that have been abandoned, a, a senator sponsored it in the first place and decided they didn't want their name on it, they drop it. Um, maybe they don't want you to see that, but it's there. Um, and then we also, for data quality purposes, when we had issues, the, you can kind of trick Lucene into saying, I don't want anything. Uh, so when you're searching for null values, uh, summary A star and Z star, or not summary A star and Z star, it's essentially for an empty value. Um, this actually points to one of the downsides of this is using Lucene uh, versus a database where it's um, a SQL level like which would make some of the queries that we're performing relatively go. I was just going to say, you guys thought about doing your own SQL language on top of this and then doing translation. Absolutely. Um, and so that's one of, the, one of the next big steps is going to be more of a UI change. Um, and also just an easy way for someone to construct these queries. Instead of having to directly interface with Lucene, um, just to either give them a nice interface for them to be able to do that, or to simplify it in a way that is much, much easier. Because um, certainly, you shouldn't, uh, we don't expect everybody to go in there and make us for the query. So, absolutely. Um, and so, so, as I was saying, uh, some, some, some queries like this and others uh, and joints and things along those lines would be much easier with SQL-like language. It is possible in Lucene, um, but a little bit more concrete. Uh, and so, Open Legend in the Wild. Um, with this past session, the end of session, uh, we saw a dramatic spike in traffic. There was some big news in New York, marriage equality, and just some other big bills that were passing. Um, and so, we saw it, you can, can't really make it out, but 60,000 users uh, on this site, which just coming from New York State's legislature, it is a very large uh, body. Um, but getting that amount of people coming in interested in open legislative data is a pretty amazing thing, I think. Um, and we were talking about steps towards internal usage of, uh, of our service, and the NY Center Twitter account, um, nearly every minute of the day, was posting updates to bills and posting to our service saying, hey, check out this bill, 
and feel free to read it. So that's the internal rebuilding trust that we had to, um, we kind of had to step through just because the service that we inherited um, did have many, many, many problems and people realize that and people are now uh, fortunately getting over that. Um, and so there were some interesting places, it was linked, there were a lot of retweets on Twitter. Um, we see in a lot of uh, traffic from Facebook, um, if we have senators' accounts or people posting links, and New York Times uh, linked to us. So again, that's just that uh, the idea that we're serving uh, or really efficient at source of the Senate, um, which we can now uh, happily say that things are working well and people can trust us now that we have these mechanisms to ensure data quality. Um, and so it should be straightforward here serving the information, and now we can move on to how do we utilize this data to draw more information, um, perhaps the voting patterns or these other queries you can make to really see what's happening with this data. Um, and so that's a so what happened to that paywall you were talking about? Okay, it's so just basically say, basically it's, it's a, yeah, and that's, it's been a point of contention um, because LBDC does still have the paywall. Um, people use that. Uh, it's mostly staffers or lobbyists that are paying for that. Um, and so a lot of what they offered, there were, point, uh, there were issues in the beginning because they were saying, we, we don't want you to offer this because this is part of our service. We'll give you the information, but you can't do it with that. And as we've moved along, it's slowly been kind of broken down, broken down, broken down. And at this point, um, we offer most of everything that they offer. There's, there's not a big difference. It's still around. Um, it's, it'll be interesting to see how it works out in the years to come. Um, but as more people, I mean, a lot of the complaints that we have, did have in the past were from the lobbyists that didn't want to pay for this service anymore, or from the people who were paying for it. Um, so as we move forward, more people will see this as a service that they can utilize. Um, the Assembly actually has an initiative to put paperless with their bills um, over the next several years, or with all of their information. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how, being that we already have the solution in place, if they would like to utilize this, or if there's anything that we can give back to them to say, hey, we're very familiar with this data, we know how to work with it, and we're more than happy to help you. Um, so the paywall, um, it, probably its days are numbered. Um, but, so, yeah. Go ahead. So we just want to compile that in one central location. Um, and that's, when we do that, we just merge it with the documents we already have. So that's why it would be easiest. Easy, not just to do like version control git, but to say that, hey, this field came in, it's been updated, or anything along those lines. And then the push out, or to um, commit to some repository to say, hey, here's the newest version, here's where it changed, here's where this bill got this action, or they changed the wording in this title because that title was offensive, or whatever the case may be. Um, so we have that. The, the current process that we're employing has that capability. Um, the reason we're not currently doing it is just because we ran into size constraints with the uh, with, with our initial thoughts on how to on how to accomplish this. Um, so it's more uh, finding a viable solution, uh, and we actually have support internally um, to offer that sort of information to say this is when the bill changed and this is exactly what changed. So when the senators are writing the bills and they're working with staffers. Yeah, so I hear what you're saying about your mm -hmm. end, but I wonder what you're getting it from and if there's another repository. So, okay, so LBDC does, uh, which is the Legislative Bill Ejection Commission, the journal clerk sends the information to them, and LBDC, LBDC is seen as the kind of uh, the, the, sort, the main source for this sort of data. So this, they do have all of that stored um, uh, in, inside of their database. They're, they are uh, the repository for information. Okay. We, but 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, it's done collectively in a, in a Word document of some sort, maybe a Lotus document, depending upon who and what office, and then that gets sent to the journal clerk. Uh, the journal clerk then prints it out physically and then retypes it into the mainframe system that is the LDBC system. Um, and historically, if you take a look at the bills that have been passed throughout the year, the, toward the end of session, there will be a number of bills that are actually correcting the language that uh, and the, the grammar of bills that were passed earlier on in the session because somebody mistyped the bill as it was coming in. And so, um, you know, I could, during the 2008 to 2009 session, um, there were, uh, a, I mean, there was one week of essentially uh, political debates over changing the grammar of bad grammar that had been passed beforehand. Uh, where laws, I mean, people were like, okay, we understand that you guys are the new party in power, but shouldn't you at least have some proper concepts of grammar and have propositions? And, like, this bill doesn't refer to anything. And actually, earlier on, when we had uh, Open Ledge, we had people who were commenting on the fact that these pieces were, were missing, which is what inspired us to have a uh, 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 bill buzz, which Jared, as an intern, then took and started building this other reporting system, and it kind of like, oh, this is this is great. So if I could make a statement, uh, in my life, I've spent the past few years using separation of the function of the work of the office. Yeah, I think a good I think a good thing to point out here is that uh, you know Jerry was talking about how we can and have experimented with this stuff already, and I really think one of the things with the Senate is that it they're going to need a demonstration of of how and why and case for how it's useful, you know, before they even start thinking about it. So, you know, we can, you know, we can do that and we can demonstrate, you know, the benefits of that, I think, um, through our service and then hopefully work to push it upstream, like a lot of the other things that we're doing. Oh, Oklahoma State Legislature uh, has a, uh, a kind of like a beta project that's completely, it uses all open source code, but the code that gets compiled doesn't necessarily, it, it itself isn't open source. But anyway, um, so they have a, a multiple series of, of uh, tools, FOSS tools that are coming in, uh, and everything is under version control, and the, the editing itself is under, is, is in you know, kind of like a browser window. Uh, it's really cool, um, except for the fact that they're doing product development at the exact same time period that they're selling the service. To, uh, to the state legislature. So anytime that there's a failure in the product development, there's a failure in the state legislature. And so those are the kind of, you know, that type of value uh, needs to be proven because everybody's risk averse. Um, it, it's a really hard sell to say, hey, we want to do product development as we did like here uh, in, in Open Ledge. It's a simple thing. You can have one or two people working on it, but when it gets to the larger issues, you, you kind of have to... Do that. Thanks. We need to do a teleprompter to the senator so he's not Yeah. And how to do commits. Yeah. You mentioned that there were other governments or other state senates that use similar back end systems. Have you considered like sharing this code or this infrastructure across other governments? Yeah, well, it's, it's currently on GitHub. Um, I mean, I think the goal from the start was to to build it up on open technologies so that we could then uh, share that across government. Uh, that's one of the, that was one of the big things with the new, the new push was that, um, yeah, the, the, the nysen.gov site is Drupal and uh, they're, they're pushing, they're trying to push back upstream some of like the plugins and things that they've had to build for it. And, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is really be able to contribute back so that way is easier for uh, other governments. Um, you know, like our CRM is built on an open source CRM and uh, you know we're currently the biggest install that they've got so we're really uh, fleshing it out and fixing a lot of things up and getting you know them to develop the right modules that would be useful to other organizations of like our scale. So uh, yeah. so good. 
In terms of transparency, uh, we feel that this brings uh, a great deal to it. And also, in, in terms of data, uh, it's because what it looks like is it looks like you're making the data both available and accessible. And uh, that's good. Uh, how much data is, do you feel is still uh, missing? <laughs> missing. Uh, in other words, it's not getting close. So how, how, how effective is it? How you know, effective okay, is it? Cool. actually showing a process versus showing what what ones? Um, well, so is uh, as far as like transparency, as far as legislative documents go, um, we are serving actually more than the uh, the cycle for paywall at this point because they did store some of this or they did store some of this information like committee votes um, and some other information uh, that they just kind of kept as part of a transaction, then when a new piece of information came along, they completely destroyed it, it was longer there. And so we're serving that sort of thing. Um, and making it available um, via, uh, or in these easy and open formats, I think does offer uh, a great deal of transparency. And then uh, encouraging people uh, to to use them, maybe that's not that important, but then offer it in an easy way that people can uh, come, in come in and come and see them and search them and uh, make their RSS feeds to see what bills are relevant to them. Um, so instead of having to keep track of all these bills in the legislature, um, to just log into the Google Reader and see that a new bill came across with this in the title or this in the text, and I think it gives people a, a great deal of, a, or it gives, it gives, it makes this data it very, very easily available, which is probably the most important or one of the most important. Yeah, it's great too. Yeah. So that was the that was the other thing is um, there, there is still like a lot of stuff that we're you know on our end we're even throwing out like the history. I mean. I think one of the goals with the version control when I started playing around with that initially was that we could have that history and we could you know, show the change sets and things. Um, and that would be really valuable. And, you know, it was, it was at first I thought that we'd do something like GitHub and we would just, um, you know, basically push the repository up there so anyone could analyze the history of the legislative data as it was changing over time in the directory structure. But um, the size is, it just got enormous really fast. Like, they make, you know, we get, like, I, I don't even know what the volume per day is, but it's a, it's a very active legislature, and, you know, we're getting it's, it's not a, lot more than, a lot more than our interface could handle, our inter, uh, infrastructure could handle. It's not like it's big data, like, no one can handle it, like, it's not, it wasn't like a terabyte, but we just didn't have the resources internally to really, you know, keep pursuing it. Hey, hey, just to speak to your point, <clears throat> so this was one of a number of different systems that were implemented that brought about greater levels of transparency. So redoing nysenate.gov was a, a big thing because we went from a static web page and senators' pages to, uh, to a dynamic front page of really dynamic senators' pages that also linked to committee content. Um, and in committee content, we you got you know blog posts, uh, all the, the the normal kind of like web 2.0 perspective. But then you have the event, um, the actual committee meeting. <clears throat> and the committee meeting became one of the most dynamic pieces of content because we're pulling in bills, we're pulling in agendas, we're pulling in uh, agendas also happens to be the listing of the bills, um, uh, uh, attendance, um, as well as video. So before this particular time period, the Senate had never been capturing committee, uh, committee meetings. You had to travel up to Albany to see what, what was going on in the committee meetings. And most committee meetings, like 80% of the committee meetings that ever happen, it's a show up, we have the agenda, do we approve the agenda, or do we, do, do we vote down the agenda? And then that's the end of the committee meeting. There's not much that discussion. But it, you, you know, the process of bills, as it moves through the, through the flow of the Senate, uh, that small meeting is really, really important. So um, figuring out how to link all of those different pieces has continued to be a challenge for, for the team. Um, and to address that transparency point, but you know you can sit there, and if you're intelligent enough, uh, which I think most people are, and what we've been seeing from the from New Yorkers is that they will go and they'll see the video, they'll read the bills, they will be able to take a listing of the different meetings, and they can actually participate uh, virtually through it. Uh, uh, I forget which uh, school did a study on on um, transcripts. And so they actually studied, because through the uh, open, leg uh, open legislation system, you can take a look at transcripts, uh, they did a study and found who are the senators that are saying nothing, and who are the senators that are saying something. 
Uh, and you know, we're starting to see similar systems arise uh, around the US through our friends at uh, Participatory Politics Foundation. They do open Congress and then also open government, uh, opengovernment.org, which is kind of, the, they're trying to be the 50 state version of what we're doing just for the Senate. Um, and you know, so that way, it, like this is a developing field. Nobody gives a shit about state government, and it's kind of inherently designed that way from the from the onset of this country. Sadly, uh, you know, you really care about your municipal government because that's where you get close to 70 percent of your government uh, uh, government resources. Uh, outside of that, 20 percent of that is is delivered to the state, and then a very small portion of that is delivered from the federal government. Um, and so that state government is where things go to die. I mean, you go and take a look at why Albany was selected, and it's like, well, it's upriver from New York City, the largest port, um, and so it's easy to get to, but the information is hard to come out of. Um, and so, you know, we can see this all across in every single state, but the things are, are developing, and this is just one system uh, that's there. And it's gonna take time, patience, uh, and, and, and really just, you know, passion uh, to make these things happen. And, um, we're out of time, I want to say that, but uh, if anybody has any, any other comments, you know, it's lunch now, we don't, uh, I don't think we would have any problems with having a big lunch table. Um, but thanks, any last statements from the audience? Thank you.